Well, we might get started. So welcome everybody. And um, there may be a few others who join us along the way. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're broadcasting to you from today. I'm coming to you from what is, was and always will be Ngunnawal and Ngambri country where I have the great privilege to live, work and play uh, as a guest on this country of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I'm acutely aware that the damage that we've done to ecosystems and the damage through climate change is something felt so much more keenly by the traditional owners of the people who are part of the country. And so I'd like to particularly acknowledge that despite that, traditional owners and other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nevertheless keep showing up in trust to help repair and recover. So I'd like to welcome particularly any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today and acknowledge that as we work through these questions of caring for the places we love, we're working through questions of helping and working with you uh, to care for country. Uh, my name is Rachel Morgan and I'm the Knowledge Broker for Bushfire Recovery with NRM Regions Australia. And we're here to take part in a webinar on facing the rising risk to ecosystems of wildfires, floods, cyclones and climate extremes. I hope this will be an interactive webinar and would like to encourage discussion initially in the chat um, and then in the Q&A. So I'd like to first of all invite you all now, our audience, um, we'd like to hear from you in the chat. We'd like to know who you are, what organisation you're coming to us from, and also what Indigenous country you reside on and that you're joining us um, here from here today. So you'll find the chat button for those of you who don't who aren't familiar at the bottom of your screen, and you'll need to select to all panellists uh, and attendees to introduce yourselves or to everyone to introduce yourselves. So please go ahead and um, introduce yourselves in the chat and we'll open up this up as a chat waterfall. Uh, and welcome. So shortly we'll be asking you to start posting your questions and thoughts in the Q&A. The Q&A button is usually right next to the chat button uh, on your screens. So here you should feel free to ask questions, but also to upvote each other's questions and to provide answers and thoughts from your own experiences if you'd like to share. So we'll be aiming to respond to the key questions in the conversation that we have and, and uh, I, hopefully we'll have a lot of the time of this webinar for interactive discussion with our panellists and speakers. Um, so please start posting questions as soon as they come to you and we'll get to as many questions as possible. But also if there are specific questions, particularly with links or resources or other things that you would li like to uh, know about but that we don't quite get to provide you in our discussion, we'll send those around when we send the recording later. So as I said before, today we'll be looking at the, at the very pressing and very concerning issue on, of the growing pressures on ecosystems that arise through natural disasters and climate extremes. And also what it means that we are looking at a rising risk of repeated extreme events and what we might do about it as the NRM sector and, and other guests who are joining us today. There are huge challenges arising from this change reality we're living in. And I'm acutely aware that many of you are experiencing the forefront of those challenges or have done. We've got extreme wildfires, floods, storms and cyclones all at once impacting our communities and our social systems in many places, our organisational systems, our industries and our ecosystems all together. And that these things experienced all together make it incredibly hard to know where to start and, and how to rebuild. And we're all, I think, growing in awareness that we will be likely experiencing more of this kind of thing and closer together. So these things are things that have come home to roost for many of us over recent years. Today, we'll be focusing primarily on the impacts to ecosystems across Australia and what we can do to build resilience in our systems. And this is not to downplay the other critical issues of community resilience, industry resilience, social resilience, and all the other things that we need to tackle in this space. And some of our speakers may speak to that in the panel discussion, but these are also matters that I hope uh, we, will, we will address in future events. They need attention in their own right, and I think it's something that we'll, uh, we'll ha be having ongoing conversations about. So now I'd like to turn to introducing our first speakers. 
Dana Bergstrom and Ewan Ritchie were co-authors on the research paper that inspired this webinar, which looked at the risks facing ecosystems across Australia and devised a framework for understanding what we might do about it. Dana is the Principal Research Fellow at the University of Wollongong and she led the review into ecosystem collapse. Ewan Ritchie is a Professor of Wildlife Ecology and a co-author on this, on this paper. And he's also done a lot of work recently understanding the impacts to ecosystems and species of the Black Summer fires. So we're going to begin by playing their pre-recorded talk um, that they've, they've used to introduce their review and the framework for responding to risks of ecosystem collapse. And then we'll hear um, from Ewan and Dana later on. Welcome everyone, Dana Bergstrom here. I'd first like to acknowledge that this talk is coming from Lutruwita, Tasmania, on the lands of the Muanina people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Earlier this year, myself, Barbara Vinica, Ewan Ritchie, Justine Shaw, with 34 more colleagues, published extensive documentation on ecosystem collapse. The work spanned from the tropics to the Antarctic and we examined in great detail the state and trajectories of 19 example ecosystems. All showed multiple lines of evidence of ecosystem collapse within their distribution, mostly spanning the last 30 years. Examining for cause, we found pressures on these ecosystems came from global climate change and regional human impacts, occurring as chronic presses and acute pulses. This can be illustrated with our collapsing Antarctic moss bed example. If we look at climate pressures in the blue circle, you can see long-term presses of increased wind speed and the ozone hole, and short-term pulses of rain events and heat wave. From our synthesis, we developed a visual model of ecosystem collapse trajectories. On the y-axis is change in three hypothetical environmental variables. Orange and blue are generally synchronous and green is antagonistic. The trend line of presses is the mean for one variable. Variability illustrates the envelope of acute pulses, with the blue variable reaching a new extreme exceeding a biological threshold prior to a change in ecosystem state, the red line, which in this case exemplifies an abrupt ecosystem collapse. We noted four main types of collapse transitions, abrupt where systems collapsed very rapidly, a smooth decline, stepped such as continued land clearing and fluctuating into eventual decline. Different collapse profiles combined with ecological knowledge can provide red flags of change and insight relevant to different temporal and spatial recovery and the effectiveness of management actions. And this brings us to the main thrust of our research combating negative change rather than just reporting it. Collapsing ecosystems are a dire warning that we are facing urgent and enormous challenges in managing whole ecosystem biodiversity that also sustains human health and well-being. So building on decades of conservation decision science, we propose the 3 A's pathway to provide clear understanding and guidance for environmental protection. It also delivers a simple top-level mnemonic for policy development and decision-making around management interventions. The simplest version of the three A's begins with awareness of the ecosystem values. Anticipation of pressure coming down the line, an action to manage these pressures and avoid impact, and then prepare for future change. If pressures are managed but there's still impact, or they can't be managed locally, such as increased frequency of marine heat waves, and impact occurs, then the simplest action choice might be to let an ecosystem recover or provide restoration assistance. Let's look at some of the action options using wet tropics rainforest as an example. Actions to avoid impacts from pressures include local fire suppression and reduction in clearing. Actions after impact could include leaving forests to recover after a storm or restorative actions such as removing of weeds or rewilding. I should note that examples of action choices for all 19 ecosystems can be found in the data supplementary book attached to our paper. More complex choices include renovation, where you change elements within the ecosystem that can no longer cope with the pressure window such as replacing with more resilient varieties or even different species. 
The most complex and expensive action is to adapt and that includes creating novel ecosystems and moving species to other areas, of course modelling inadvertent flow-on effects before such considerations. The consensus of our authors was that in some cases things are really that bad. Because change is happening in most ecosystems, including those most remote, such as Antarctica, we thought we'd take you through using the three A's in two ecosystems that we know well. A coastal reserve near my workplace in Hobart and a stream on Ewan's campus in Melbourne. So the first A is awareness of the values and along the coastal fringe of the River Derwent we have a dominant canopy of blue gums, eucalyptus, globulus and a lower canopy of Alocasiorina and Blackwoods, Acacia, Melanoxalum. It's habitat for swift parrots, scaly-breasted lorikeets, spotted owls, honey-eaters, yellow-tailed black cockatoos, magpies, ravens, goshawks, white-bellied sea eagles and little penguins. Of native mammals, there are paddy melons, bennets, wallabies, brush and ringtail possums, and the occasional bandicoot and rakali. The coastal fringing reef is dominated by temperate seaweeds, including Eclonia, and it supports populations of abalone, crayfish, many marine mollusks, and fish species, including trumpeter, pufferfish, leather jackets, weedy sea dragons, and in 2015, even a red velvet fish washed up on the local beach. Marine mammals include fur seals, bottlenose dolphins, humpback and southern right whales in winter, and the occasional killer whale and even minke whale and the leopard seal have been spotted. Deep benthic and pelagic habitats in Storm Bay are important for kelp bed extensions of the Great Southern Reef. So you can see extraordinary biodiversity in an urban setting. Now let's look at pressures for these ecosystems. Long-term pressures include increased air and sea temperatures, increased urbanisation and associated impacts, weeds, pollution in runoff, sewage outfall, increased boating and shipping, recreational fishing, tourism and the marine realm impacts of salmon farming and the southerly extension of northern species such as piney sea urchins and snapper. Short-term pulses include storms, flooding, land and marine heat waves and droughts. Fire, on the other hand, has been suppressed from this urban ecosystem. Here we can see multiple pressures that can act synergistically. A pulse event of a heavy storm with flooding combined with poor urban design and urban nutrients and contaminants pollute and erode the nearshore environment. Non-native species present both chronic presses, as with established populations of rodents, blackbirds and starlings, and pulse events from hunting by domestic cats and the occasional uncontrolled dog. The last big pressure is direct human activity, including chopping down healthy mature trees to improve views, dumping of garden refuge which then establish, through to the very industrious activities of setting up lounge rooms and private garbage tips on local beaches. The third A in the three A's at action. Once pressures are identified, they can in many cases be acted upon to remove or reduce. Obviously, both global and regional action is needed to address climate change. More local management actions in the coastal reserve include avoidance of predator pressure through fences to keep out domestic cats and dogs. After impact, the coastal fringe is usually left to recover after storms. Restoration activities include weed removal followed by replanting of native elements. Some rewilding is occurring with native plantings of nature strips and where orchards had once been established before urbanisation. Renovation, where you replace one element that can't cope with the current pressure window with one that can, may be needed in the area because there's very little blue gum regeneration. So large habitat trees are not being replaced. In adjacent pelagic waters, restoration of kelp forest is being trialled with selective breeding of kelp to cope with warmer conditions. Now, let's leave Tassie and head to Melbourne and you and Richie. So here we are in a heavily modified riparian ecosystem in the east of Melbourne. And despite appearances, these areas actually have really high biodiversity value. 
including for species such as the gang gang cockatoo, the yellow-tailed black cockatoo, the native water rat or akali. So these areas allow animals to live within our cities and move along them as well as important wildlife corridors. These areas face a number of threats and they include pollution, particularly from stormwater runoff, domestic animals such as cats and dogs that if not restrained properly may chase, harm and kill native wildlife, erosion of banks due to the loss of native vegetation, also compounded by further encroachment from building, and also invasive plants and animals, which in some cases can compete with and harm the native wildlife and plants that are living already in these ecosystems. Being aware of the important biodiversity values of these ecosystems, anticipating their threats, means that we can take action that includes improving stormwater runoff and responsible disposal of waste, improving laws and regulations that ensure that domestic animals don't harm biodiversity living in these ecosystems, planning laws that prevent further loss of these habitats as urbanisation increases, and where possible, restoring these areas, including replanting with native plants and removing invasive plants. OK, wrapping up. The three A's is a useful mean and communication tool as well as a high level planning tool. It's first step thinking and really easy to explain to managers and the community alike and can be applied at all levels from national plans to local land care groups. It can be used in all ecosystems, not just the ones you have data indicating they're collapsing elements. Summarising the three A's, awareness of the values, anticipation of the pressures, action to stem the pressures. Remembering no action is high risk and leads to loss. The action choices are to let recover, help restore, renovate and finally and expensively adapt. We hope that many people adopt the three A's approach in their work and it contributes to clearer policy development and more effective management of our precious natural estate. Thank you, Dana and Richie. Uh, great um, and, and really detailed introduction um, of how that um, framework can help us to, to move forward with what we're facing in our ecosystems. So I'm aware that many of you in the room are here because you've um, experienced extreme natural disasters and that you have been the managers or policy makers or, or community builders who have been responding to recovering um, after the Black Summer fires or after many other um, experiences that we've had in this continent recently. So um, I've asked you and now to give us a little bit of a different take on that review um, that was done uh, to really think through where bushfires um, in particular have had have had an uh, having an ongoing impact on ecosystems the impact of wildfire or, or of altered fire regimes and how these things interact with other threats impacting our ecosystems and I'm now going to hand over to Ewan to walk us through some of that thanks Ewan thanks Rachel I just want to um, acknowledge again that I'm, I'm living and working on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people and I wish to acknowledge their elders past present and emerging so Rachel's asked me to talk about fire today. And I also just want to, I guess, also echo what Rachel was saying is that, yeah, I'll pass on my sort of, I guess, deeper sympathies and thoughts, uh, you know, for all that have been affected by these horrible disasters that we've experienced, whether it be fires or floods or other, um, you know, big impacts on the environment in recent years. And I understand for many people, you know, these are still ongoing issues and, and, and affecting people in a range of ways. So I just want to acknowledge that as well. And, Another thing as well is that although I find myself now living in Southern Australia, um, I probably actually have more experience with fire in Northern Australia, having spent about 15 years in North Queensland in particular. Um, but I am aware of fire and, and our group uh, is working extensively on fire ecology projects in Southern Australia as well now. But as was mentioned by Rachel and also um, fantastic uh, presentation put together by Dana, we put together this review looking at ecosystems and as you can hopefully see, you know, fire, if we look at these um, pulse pressures on ecosystems, fire features for a number of these ecosystems you can see here over on the left. So it really is a pervasive issue for a lot of ecosystems. And therefore it's something that we need to address. And I think a key point straight off the top of the bat is that, 
you know, although of course fire is a big problem for environments and it can be difficult to manage directly there are also many other things that we can do as managers, uh, as, as scientists and so forth, um, you know, actions that can actually make a big difference to the impact of a fire and also the recovery phase after fire. So I guess I just wanted to stress that. And, and again, Rachel touched on this, that there's all these interacting threats that are happening at the same time. And we can see over here with these regional pressures, both again, presses or pulses, so something that's happening basically constantly um, versus something that might happen periodically. Uh, invasive species, of course, is a really big part of that. And we know that we have issues with things like feral cats and foxes, and they've obviously most notably, noticeably affected our, our mammals in particular, um, but also other range of other wildlife and invasive herbivores as well. So deer, of course, particularly in southeastern Australia, are a huge issue um, and are impacting environments following fire as well, particularly fire recovery. Um, so managing invasive species is a really big part of that as well. And of course, grazing pressure and fire management. Um, so you, we can see, of course, on the right hand side here, you know, examples of um, fire and fire regimes that have caused quite significant changes to ecosystems. Um, so in the top, we hear these four panels here, we can see the sort of transition that's occurred in some environments in northern Australia. Um, in particular in relation to gamba grass, which is a fire loving species, if there is such a thing. Um, and that causes fire to get into the canopy and change the overall ecosystem. And then of course, we've got um, impacts on the ash forests and Gondwanan forests, um, most notably in, in Tasmania. But as was beautifully described in the presentation by Dana, you know, part of the, this paper that we put together, the, the aim was not to sort of you know, I guess, reiterate the problems that we have as much as solutions and tangible solutions and tractable solutions. And I think, you know, this three A's approach, it, it is really attractive in the sense that it's simple in, in terms of way that it's formulated, um, but it can lead to actions that really do make a difference. And I just want to sort of, I guess, highlight that, you know, during the fires, which were horrible. I think no one's going to obviously disagree about that. There was also inspiring stories of things that generally did make a difference. And, you know, I think for me, the wool of my pine example is a great example of that, about being aware of the values that you have. So those pines that we know that there's very few of those left um, and they live in these really isolated pockets, uh, you know, west of Sydney in, in um, locations that are kept relatively secret um, you know, firefighters went in there and set up, um, you know, sprinkler systems and so forth uh, to protect these, these plants um, in the face of fire. And that made a, a noticeable difference to their survival during those fires. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said about sort of focusing on things that we can do and the positive outcomes that have occurred. And of course, we know about, you know, the impacts that things like um, mountain pygmy possums have suffered, both for, due to the decline of bogong moths but also fire and predators as well. And so Zoos Victoria has been doing some great work there about you know, actual interventions, including the sort of famous now bogon bickies, which are these protein rich biscuits that they feed to the, um, to the possums to get them through the tough time. So these are all sort of interventions, if you like, actions that we can do um, in the face of a disaster such as a fire, but also those compounding threats such as predators as well, or in the case of bogong um, moth decline as well. A really key component of this too that, you know, I don't feel comfortable talking about for, for much time today because I'm a non-Indigenous person, but I think it needs to be recognised is that in terms of managing fire, clearly there's a really large role here for First Nations people, working with First Nations people and understanding just how much some of our ecosystems have changed in terms of their fire regimes, but potentially also what they could be. And, and so in a positive sense, in terms of restoring, you know, um, cultural burning practices. And I say cultural burning practices because cultural fire is not just about hazard reduction burning. It's much more than that. Um, and again, I don't want to talk about that in detail because it's not appropriate for me to do so. But I think, you know, work by um, Michael Sean Fletcher, Michaela Mariani and colleagues has really shown the importance of understanding um, cultural burning practices and how that can potentially shape 
some of our ecosystems and in some cases potentially help to reduce fuel loads and make some of these environments um, a bit more resilient and less prone to fire. To step you through an example, as Dana also did in that presentation, if we look at an example here of, you know, montane and subalpine um, forests, we can see here that we have these issues of it, you know, increasing um, uh, temperature, climate, um, more lightning strikes, which was also a big problem for parts of Tasmania, including impacting some of those Gondwanan forests. And of course, that led to, you know, um, these fires compounded, of course, by drought. And we know, you know, with the 2019 fires, that fire started actually in winter and it started in a rainforest in Queensland, which, you know, those things really shouldn't happen. So these are big issues that we have um, minimal control over as individuals or as, as communities, if you like. But what we do have control over at a much smaller scale or a regional scale is things like these, you know, impacting um, co-occurring threats like you know, non-invasive herbivores, sorry, invasive herbivores, I should say. So things like uh, feral horses um, and also deer and managing these impacts, as well as, of course, sustainable grazing practices. And by doing that, we can potentially lead to better vegetation recovery or even condition prior to fire. Also, as Dana mentioned, we can have um, restoring these ecosystems after fire. So aerial reseeding of areas, and that's happened for, as an example for the um, ash forest, the alpine ash. Um, there's been reseeding programs that have occurred for those, um, for that species in parts of Victoria. So I guess this is again, it's just stressing that, you know, we do have this ability um, to actually be proactive um, in the face of these, these um, you know, horrible events. Um, so in some ways that's empowering. I certainly feel that that's, it's an empowering way to, to I guess, approach this issue. Um, and as Rachel mentioned right at the start too, you know, I was heavily involved with the response of the Victorian um, Agency, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, about how to respond to those fires. And although unquestionably it was the most stressful time for me um, and many people in the room in terms of seeing what was happening to our wildlife and our ecosystems it was also one of the most inspiring times that I've seen because I've never seen so many um, managers policymakers, scientists and others all get together so quickly and work together to try and find tractable workable solutions to dealing with this issue and I don't have time to talk about all these points here on the right hand side today, but there are a number of things that we can do um, to both manage the impact of fire, um, promote resilience to fire, and therefore also aid recovery. And so, you know, there was a number of steps involved in that response. It's a very integrated approach. There was, of course, initial reconnaissance to see what had happened to environments, to see what species had survived. And I would also say too that although there's been many, you know, sort of sad stories, if you like, about ecosystems and wildlife, there's been a number of surprises of wildlife that have done far better than we um, expected. It, so that's a, a very much a good thing. Some wildlife, of course, were extracted and taken out of local areas. Um, so the bristle bird was an example of that. Wildlife welfare was prioritised to, you know, help animals recover. Also, in some cases, animals were provided with food um, in the wild, but that was done um, very carefully to make sure that there wasn't um, other issues that may have you know, um, been associated with that. So free feeding animals, if you're not an expert, of course, is not recommended because you need to have the right diet and also not potentially um, attract other animals in that might cause other problems as well. Threat management was a big focus. So there was a very large and extensive um, control program of uh, feral deer, uh, feral pigs, um, in large parts of Victoria, uh, also um, management of things like uh, particularly foxes with 1080 um, baiting and that happened also in parts of New South Wales quite extensively as well. So again, that, that's a really strong focus and we know from considerable body of research and um, a, a paper led by a PhD student, um, Billy Geary and colleagues, including myself, um, it really shows that there is a strong relationship between fire and invasive predators. And that's why many of our species, um, native species have found themselves in so much trouble. But again, it, it also in some ways is encouraging because we know we have the tools available in many cases to not potentially get rid of uh, cats and foxes um, completely, but certainly reduce their impacts. Um, 
again, a strong focus here for Indigenous um, people um, working and uh, on country and understanding the impact on country and 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 moving um, and sort of enacting ways to heal country, promoting resilience. So the importance of refuges. So identifying areas in the landscape that might have really high biodiversity values, and therefore again reducing things like herbivore impact, uh, invasive species impact potentially establishing sanctuaries within landscapes, putting up fences to stop herbivores and so forth. So promoting resilience within the landscape itself to allow animal populations to build up and recover and in some cases spill back out into the landscape. That's really important. And then of course, there is a focus on um, being prepared and sharing knowledge um, with communities um, and experts. Um, Nature led community recovery, including citizen science projects and, and communities themselves really um, you know, collecting data and information to track the progress and recovery of areas uh, after fire. And then of course, coordination. So there's a lot in that. And I'm very happy to talk about any of these points in uh, far more detail and discussion, um, but I'll stop there um, so that others can um, talk. Thank you, Ewan. So we'll get back to um, discussing some of those points in our discussion in just a moment. Um, I do want to encourage everybody to please pop your questions or or even thoughts into the Q&A um, that might help us um, think through what it is that you want to hear from our speakers today. So please feel free to put them in at any time. A reminder, your Q&A button is near your chat button um, and you can just add and uh, upvote questions and respond to each other's questions there. Yeah. Um, but our third speaker is from the natural resource management sector. Um, he is Environment Program Manager at Ocean Watch. So Simon Rowe um, has worked with his team at Ocean Watch doing critical work to understand the impacts of the Black Summer fires and more recently the floods on aquatic systems and also doing uh, really exciting coastal recovery work. So I'm going to hand over to Simon to tell us a bit about that work now. Thanks, Rachel. Morning, all. Um, I guess working for Ocean Watch as the marine NRM, we're focused on the health and productivity of our marine environment. And uh, thinking back retrospectively, when I completed uni in 2001, which seems like a long time ago, climate change was still a bit futuristic. It was still sort of being debated, but uh, fire affecting mangroves wasn't a thing. Floods depositing debris into the ocean seemed a bit more localised. But even back then, it was something that would pull down a uh, snag a fishing trawler. Uh, things like low oxygen we learned about like causing fish kills was pretty well understood. It was documented, but it was sort of seen as the circle of life. So things have changed a little bit. Um, when you fast forward 21 years, um, how far has things changed? How far have our actions progressed? I think the ocean's certainly dynamic, but damn, it's taken a beating. Um, so today I'll be talking from the point of view of an NRM practitioner tackling and maybe even contemplating our country's drought, fire, floods, associated plague, bio movements, essentially change. Um, to start with, I always find it interesting the information that the people that work in slightly separate occupations have. So the Insurance Council of Australia understands cycles and risks better than most. And I was looking on their website just recently, the Southeast Brisbane floods uh, that affected New South Wales, Brisbane, lost more than three billion, which is huge, right? But that's property and item loss. How much did it affect the environment? And for a person like me, that, that figure, and you guys might know this, there's some, there might be some research out there, but as a practitioner, I'm writing and delivering and reporting on grants. It's on this constant treadmill. And so um, you sort of focus on what needs to be done next, but not necessarily, always sort of trying to think ahead as well. However, as the cycles are better understood, the risk financially becomes a statistics game. It's far harder to get insurance for coastal assets prone to storm surge, beach erosion, flood inundation, properties near bushland. Um, and really with that climate extreme hitting the insurance sector, they've been bleeding. And that means they pull back from risk, risk extraction. And that causes problems in other areas as well. However, we're all here to stay. We're looking after the environment um, and we face an increasingly difficult risk. So moving on to the uh, Christmas fires of 2019-20, um, I was out on the property in the Southern Tablelands where my parents live near Krupal and the smoke's coming in my face, uh, watching the fires near me up, thinking when, when will those flames arrive? 
Um, and I'm in the RFS down there for the Lagan Brigade. So I was on standby essentially for three days and nights waiting for my turn to go out and do my little bit. But um, once that passed, in a practical sense, what comes next? What happens when the combat agencies retire? Um, in our instance, um, in the Marine, it's a very novel space. So there was a round table first day back in Canberra. Um, from that point to the point where we were able to employ someone to specifically work on this, in this instance, Claudia Santoria, a spatial officer, it took about eight months. So the cogs are slightly turning in this space. Um, and that's especially so for novel, non-human, non pedal livestock responses. I know others like the local land services were out there pretty quickly um, working with vets, et cetera. But for us in this, in this marine space, it's a little bit different. So some of our immediate challenges post bushfire were where to apply to it, where to apply our effort, in what form, how much is it going to cost, an environment of severe supply chain and movement issues, if you remember back to everything else that was starting to go on there. Um, so we saw the army with bulldozers, excavators ready to go on larger capital works. Um, they were looking at open up estuaries, but things like green tape and local procurement policies made that immediate movement, that immediate keenness to do something quite tricky. Um, and in New South Wales, it was the councils, the landowners, the managers probably had the most boots on the ground to actually go out and do what they could with what they had. So Ocean Watch is only small. We're a little charity. We've got four project-linked FTEs. Um, so we're really limiting our capacity to our people and the contacts we have around the country. Um, also note we're paid fee-for-service model. So we're, we're mostly reactive which in retrospect is not great, but that's sort of where we work. So we often get called in to work on market failures or problems. And I was sort of relating this back to uh, Chinese medicine. I suppose that's more about reactive health, whereas Western medicine is very, sorry, proactive health, Western medicine being a bit more reactive once sick. And I sort of see thinking about, about our NRM sector that we do, do a lot of things that are reactive and we probably need to move more into the proactive sphere something to think about. Um, so with that in mind, the model we worked on in terms of this bushfire was a project that wouldn't necessarily provide answers in terms of a report, but it would provide data for informed decision-making. So it was about setting others up to um, look at what they could do. Um, and first of all, we had an impact survey. Um, we also went out and bought social expertise in the form of our officer, body is listening today, um, with an ecological bent towards specific impacts to the coastal and marine habitats. That survey led to us being able to ground truth some of the fire grounds and they couldn't be more different from state to state um, and then put together layers of information. And this all fitted into something we call the Fish Habitat Protection Protocol, which is essentially all about asking questions and encouraging discussions. So we have been doing a little bit of this um, as an, another project on the South Coast, going through fire affected communities, talking to water asset managers, tour operators, farmers, oyster farmers, um, fellow NRM practitioners and fire combat agencies, trying to get their thoughts on some of these topics which are quite difficult to discuss at times. Because they're new, they can be confronting, um, they're outside their normal realms of operations, but it's something we need to do. Um, so in summary, we have some fundamental issues when trying to gain resources from ground work through interventions. Um, we have a real lack of baseline information for conditions, things like kelp, abalone, urchin, seagrass, mangrove. How do we know um, how they're going if we didn't know how they were prior to the impact? What's the target we're trying to seek to um, get to afterwards? And thinking sometimes that mistakes could be with us for perpetuity, so we have to make good decisions. So, Ideally, we align our researchers with policies with on-ground practitioners. It sounds easy, but in practice, it's quite difficult. Um, specifically with fire-affected mangroves, so for those that don't know, they cook surrounded by fuel loads in estuaries like the Clyde, south of Sydney. Um, and that's something that hasn't been heard of necessarily around the world. So it's, it's new. Um, we're thinking, will, will natural seed recall allow them to recover naturally? In New South Wales, there's 184 hectares of salt marsh and 28 hectares of mangrove across 18 estuaries. So do we leave nature to do its thing? Do we go into an assisted recovery model? Um, when do we actually intervene? 
So various universities and state agencies are monitoring these sites and why not? It's a fantastic, exciting topic. However, the area that we're looking at is reasonably small. So there is the challenge of how not to tread over each other's toes or seedlings in our example, or deposition plates and how to adapt to incoming resources to actually speed intervention as those cogs turn, as, as people do want to do something on the ground. Um, especially when um, intervention means maintaining a living for some, while others research and monitoring is a living. Is science more important than opinion? Is doing something on a smaller scale better than nothing? Lots of questions, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so uh, those, I think, are really good provocative questions to help us um, get our discussion started in just a moment. But before we move to discussion, we've got one more panellist to introduce. So um, Sarah Hoyle is joining us from Terrain NRM, where she is Manager of Biodiversity and Climate. Sarah and the uh, community and the coastal catchments um, in their region have had their own experiences of extreme events in quick succession in the form of two cyclones, Larry and Yasi, impacting their region a few years apart. After these experiences, their networks did a lot of reflecting on the lessons they learned for building resilience into the future. So we're going to go to Sarah in a moment, but before we do, we do that, we're going to play a short excerpt from the fantastic video they produced, showing some of the work they've done, um, it, they did, and that they have continued to do in response to the cyclones. And at the end of the webinar, we'll provide a full link to the video so you can watch it in full. Um, and I'd highly recommend uh, looking at it because I think there's a lot of really wonderful uh, insights and lessons from that work. But um, right now we're going to watch uh, just a few excerpts. Every cyclone will be different and every cyclone will reveal new environmental issues. Before Yasi clobbered us, uh, we were aware of the fact that the mahogany gliders were here. Uh, we lost approximately a thousand trees on the course. Now that was a significant blow to the habitat of the glider, obviously. I mean, it, their gliding distance is a maximum of approximately 30 metres, I believe. Uh, there are areas now where they don't have that distance. Yeah, when one of the trees was taken down and a, a mahogany glider was discovered in the hollows within the tree, uh, it certainly reinvigorated interest in it again, uh, with National Parks and Wildlife and Terrain becoming involved. And it also became a particular interest to the golf club that we could maintain some sort of protection for them. Prior to the cyclone, the estimates were between 1,500 to 2,000 animals um, remained in the wild. Um, and I guess we really don't know um, what's happened to the population. They've got a very limited range, uh, the smallest range of any mammal in Australia. And the habitat of this endangered species that was already fragmented and vulnerable was right in the path of the eye of the cyclone. We want to make their habitat uh, as natural as possible. There's been a revegetation process uh, occurring on the course. Uh, with terrain coming in and very thankfully providing hundreds of trees, they will be uh, of some significance for, for the gliders in years to come. It'll just ensure that we can keep them here on the course. It's reaffirmed the biggest issues we've got, and that's connectivity and this fragmentation of habitat. I think we need to start talking about individual trees making a difference because I think that's probably easier for some people to understand too. That sometimes it's a single tree that can make the difference between whether gliders can get from one place to another. In a way, the positive that comes out of this glider losing his home, it's the first place really in Cardwell where we've had the opportunity to look at using this as something really special for the community. So the signage going in that will be educational um, and for visitors, it adds another dimension to their understanding of how special the wet tropics are and especially these coastal forests. Because we hear so much about rainforest and how special the rainforest is. And quite often these lowland coastal woodlands and all of the species that rely totally on them that can't live in rainforest um, are overlooked. Uh, Girigan is a um, self-made organisation made by the traditional owners themselves for ourselves. For a long time, the board has wanted to see the development of a ranger program. And as it turned out, the political stars all lined up, I suppose. And uh, 
we were able to seek and acquire funding from both the state and the federal government to develop our own indigenous ranger program. The rangers, they really came to the fore after the event. They were able to get out there with the chainsaws and vehicles and, that and just assist the broader community in, in uh, cleaning up after the cyclone. But I've got to mention here that we had three other indigenous ranger programs that came and helped us as well, from the Gulf and uh, the guys from Ewan and rangers from around uh, Mariba, Burke down that area from uh, Archer Point. And we're here for the long haul and, and you know, we're just so grateful to those guys to come and help us at, at that time of need, you know. In, a, in, the, in a time of a disaster like Cyclone Yassi, and the Cyclone don't discriminate, they don't just damage black people, they damage everybody, you know. From a public image perspective, our guys are out there helping no matter who they are, black, white or brindle. And, um, and in the hour of need, they were there in, in force, helping uh, the broader community recover. And a lot of real positive feedback from the broader community. Like since Yassi, they have done a lot of work for the community. And we just think it's marvellous what they do. At this whole disaster, uh, we're looking at developing a, uh, an Indigenous Ranges disaster and contingency plan for any future disasters. You know? And under this plan, we'll be able to unify all those Indigenous Ranger programs throughout North Queensland here in the Gulf and the Torres Straits to be able to assist in the, uh, with a moment's notice to any disaster anywhere in the state. You know? Uh, if we're able to do a, some sort of a social analysis of the whole thing, I think we'd be very surprised if we could put it to some sort of dollar figure. It'd be very, the contribution would be enormous, you know. Mm. I want to say thanks, um, Sarah, for, <laughs> for the people at Terrain producing that video and, and all of those insights. Um, so I'm going to open up uh, to invite you now, Sarah, to, to tell us a little bit about that experience of going through those two cyclones in, in fairly quick succession and and if you could please give us an idea of uh, a couple of the really key takeaway lessons you've learned in your region for building resilience in the face of these kinds of challenges. Thanks Rachel. I'm just acknowledging that I wasn't with Terrain at this time so I'm speaking on behalf of the organisation and all the learnings that we had at that time. Um, that the last major cyclone you mentioned was um, Cyclone Yassi in 2011 and prior to that was Cyclone Larry in 2006 so they're only five years apart. And we expect more of those really destructive cyclones in this region through climate change. And actually through uh, preparing for this discussion today, it really made us reflect this, this wet season, we've had very few cyclones, um, but uh, now's the time to start thinking about the next wet season, which starts usually in January next year and, and really make sure we do have our ducks in a row for, for future, future um, cyclones like we've seen. So, you know, our major sort of learnings were around a disaster resilient community is one that works together to understand and manage the risks that it confronts. And I think that really fits within that framework of awareness, anticipation and action that was pointed out before. Um, we really found that cleanups and the re and emergency response really needed to be taken cautiously with an integrated coordinated approach. And you can see it needed to involve those local land care groups and First Nations groups, um, researchers in the NRM sector, who have a good understanding of the natural environment of that area, um, because one of the things that happens is, you know, you, you can end up with a lot more ecological damage post cyclone if you leave things to yellow machines. So um, that's a really important lesson for us to know is, you know, um, you need to leave de debris where it falls, wherever possible. You need to, um, you know, stop and ensure that you're not removing any remaining vegetation, messing up the soil structure or seed banks because um, you really are then restricting the capacity of the forested areas to recover and you're really um, going to be spreading weeds and pests. So that's a, that's a major learning for us. Um, for future disasters, you know, as an NRA organisation, we've got no formal role in disaster recovery. So it's really important for us to maintain those strong partnerships with our community, with local government, with state agencies, with First Nations groups, as you saw, Gurigan Aboriginal Corporation now have a really big range of groups. Um, and industry bodies and, and researchers. So those things are really important to us. So in terms of um, our region though, you know, we, in terms of the future and, and resilience, we really need to build um, resilience through a landscape approach. And that includes um, actions, including restoration, protection of existing habitat and management of pet, pests and weeds, um, bring consideration of things we know are threatened species and ecological communities, but also those that are at risk. So some of the really important parts of that 
um, resilient is restoring our upland refugia um, and connectivity that links lowland and upland environments to um, assist that um, management of acute effects such as cyclones, but also the chronic impact from hotter temperatures when we're actually seeing, you know, um, species moving up into the cooler climates. Um, but this is going to require significant significant investment. And so one thing I didn't mention was that there's also, you know, we, we really need to be careful about managing those. That's why we need those restoration and protection of existing habitats because we see um, the things that are most impacted by cyclones are those these small fragments of remnant vegetation, riparian areas and a little rainforest. It gets the most extensive, extensive damage and has the hardest time recovering. So that was a fairly long answer, <laughs> Rachel, but I'll let you take it from there. No, that's really great, Sarah. Uh, and there's quite a few points there that I think I might come back to, including how you actually get that coordinated response in the in the post um, disaster recovery moment, because uh, I think that's that um, is is a really broad experience of that. You know, how, how do you stop more damage in that kind of in that moment of everybody scrambling? Um, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Right now, we're opening up to the full um, Q and A for all of our panelists to to jump in, and um, and I hope this discussion will be interactive also for you, our audience. So please continue to pop, pop your questions in the chat and um, and upvote each other's questions as well. Um, but I think um, I'm I'm actually going to start. Uh, with the question that Kate Forrest has put to us. So um, Kate has asked, is there a crossover with the management and recovery of ecosystems and protection of other assets, such as infrastructure and agricultural systems? And how is this, you know, in, in the cases of whether it's the fires and floods in southeastern Australia, the cyclones, or or some of your experiences um, with the, with in Victoria, Ewan, how is it being managed to coordinate between agencies? Is there enough understanding of ecological impact and required management to negotiate this kind of coordinated activity? Um, so I might start with you, Simon, on that question and, and come to you as well, Sarah, and see where we go. Yeah, no, I still think we're in our infancy, really. I, I feel I, we'll probably never, ever get there, but we're still learning. And so we'll, we'll continue to need to monitor for the legacy of what we actually do do in this space as to whether it's a good or bad thing. Um, is there enough understanding of that? Yeah. That's what I'd say to that one. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that understanding has grown between agencies in, in the course of the work that you've been doing? Do you think that there's more understanding now than there was before this began? It's certainly grown within individuals, but then when individuals change positions, etc., it's difficult to retain that knowledge. And I suppose individuals working in one environment, moving to another environment, it's never lost, they apply it to the new space. But, um, I guess as our sector needs to grow, we also need to put effort into passing on that, that knowledge to, to new people um, and also respecting the knowledge that is out there but isn't necessarily within the organisation yet. And there's, there's plenty of that out there. People read in the landscapes better than we can that are out there all the time that just haven't, that they're not in that role, they're not being paid for it yet, but they're, they're very interested. So it's a tricky one. Yeah. Sarah, what? Actually, Dana, you, do you want to hop in now? Yeah. Yes, I might just hop in there, Rachel. I mean, one of the things that's happened over the last five years is the merger of agriculture and the Department of Environment at the federal level. And so I, I, I'm embedded in that with the Antarctic Division. But one of the things that's happening there, for example, is a lot more coordination of science across all the various divisions in, in DOOR. And so I think if under the new government, if the department stays together, that opportunity for communication across agriculture to, um, to the environment, I think will, will improve. Because certainly uh, one of the things that are coming out in the literature, and particularly in the, in the States um, and in Canada, is the idea of um, ecological intensification. And so that the idea that agriculture is embedded in a landscape um, and that you flow from your use of natural ecosystems into your agricultural systems and to treat the whole thing as a continuum is something that's really, really important to, to move to, not agricultural intensification, ecological intensification. Um, and so um, one of the things in looking at the exemplar of ecosystem collapse, the Murray-Darling Basin was certainly one of them. And so here you've got 
42% of our food growing areas next to collapsing ecosystems. And that to me was a really big signal going, if, you, if your natural ecosystems can fall over, your agricultural ecosystems can equally fall over. So I think Kate's got a really good idea there um, of trying to improve the linkages between the two areas. And of course, that's music to our ears in the in the NRM sector. So, Sarah, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I think that's um, that's exactly right. Is that's where we we fit best is is bringing those two two parts of the environment together between ag and the environment. And if you watch the rest of that film, which we didn't see all of today, there is a whole section on how the agricultural sector managed um, those cyclones and responded to them. Um, and yeah, I think that's our opportunity. I think, you know, as I said earlier, we don't have any sort of formal role in the disaster of disaster, disaster response networks in our region. And, and so we have to, as Simon said, we just have to keep making sure. And it, like I said, it reminded me through this process of going, I'm gonna need to make sure that for the next wet season, we are prepared again um, to be able to jump in and provide that um, support and coordination and, um, and insight into the impacts that these sort of responses have on the natural environment in the short term, particularly in the cleanup phase. Great, and you and yeah, I guess I would just add to you know everything. I agree with everything that's just been said, and 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 what Dana was saying is that I don't actually see these things as separate. You know that you know ecosystems are among the best assets we have. <laughs> you know we we are part of ecosystems, so I don't in my mind actually separate the two. Having said that. Um, you know, there are examples definitely of cross agency um, cooperation and collaboration. And, you know, if you think about things like even fire management and invasive species management, you know, both of those things directly affect agriculture in a big way. Um, and particularly, of course, where you've got, you know, reserves embedded in a matrix where you've got agriculture as well. Um, things like deer, of course, are a big problem for viticulture, um, for, for, you know, um, pastoralists and all sorts of things. So, you know, it, there's definitely collaboration going on. There, there are definitely challenges, though, as well. And I think Sarah highlighted that really well with, you know, cleaning up, you know, that people do after fires. You know, it's an important thing to do, but it has to be done in a very sensitive way because, yeah, removing, you know, coarse woody debris, as we often call it, and all that sort of fallen timber and stuff, which is really important habitat for so many species. If we don't quite get that right, that, that can have an environmental impact. And, and the same with fires, you know, that protection of human assets, which is obviously a really important thing to do can sometimes put environmental assets at risk as well. So there, there's still a lot more work that needs to, and thinking that needs to be done in that space. But yeah, I don't, I don't actually separate the two in my mind. I see them as, as being part of the same larger ecosystem, if you like, for a better choice of um, word. But um, yeah, there's definitely a lot, lot going on in that space for sure. Thanks, everyone. And I'm going to push this question a little bit further before we move on to something else, because I think Ag Abigail's made a really important point in the in the chat, which is that um, when you're working um, in that post fire context or that post disaster context um, with private landholders, there are also sensitivities about when to engage. So for many of us, we might see the landscape as a whole, but um, but the idea of bringing ecological resilience or, or recovery to the table when people are putting their fences back and, and you know, counting the losses of their livestock and, and so on, um, uh, you know, and, and suffering other, other consequences is a really sensitive one. So I guess my kind of response and also a question to this is, can we do that work beforehand? to help, you know, and how do, how do we do that work beforehand so that when people look around them, um, when landholders look around them, they can also, you know, immediately see the interconnection between the need to recover that bit of habitat over there um, and, and what that does um, to protect them. So I might just sort of put that out as a provocation, but also see um, Sarah uh, or someone, if you'd like to sort of jump in uh, in response to that, sort of pre-preparing that ground and how, and how we're doing in that. Yeah, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little, but I think it is like maintaining those partnerships, you know, at, at all times outside of those emergency spaces and, and, and cross-sectorally, as we talked about, you know, uh, that really does mean in, in our region, you know, there's some there's a couple of strong industry um, agricultural groups that we have who, you know, dominate the agriculture sector and we're very, very strongly um, engage with them and have strong partnerships with them. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we do continue to educate 
um, our growers about those other impacts of, of, of those, you know, activities that, that feel like, yes, of course, I think that, you know, you can't approach anyone when their um, livelihood is at risk immediately to, to tell them about the fluffy glider um, or the, you know, the cute little, the little critter. Um, and so you do need to be sensitive to that, but having those existing relationships and partnerships in place already really makes a difference. Mm. Great. Yeah, I, I think that one of the things that I'm aware of is that, you know, I think people working in the environmental space are, you know, acutely aware of grief. They experience it constantly in regards to the environment. And I think, you know, they're, they're generally very empathetic and sensitive to grief experienced by others for other reasons. So I think, you know, that, that it, that's a good thing, obviously, and it makes dealing with these situations better. But as Sarah said, you know, maintaining and establishing relationships is really the key to it, you know, and I think one thing that I think is regrettable from my perspective a little bit is across Australia, the loss of extension officers and things like that, I think have such a valuable role in um, sharing information um, for the benefit of everybody. Um, but of course, also maintaining those relationships and connections through time. And I think Simon touched on this about, you know, turnover of staff and so forth. So I think, you know, a, a key equation of this is investing in those people and those sort of structures, if you like, that allow to maintain that knowledge sharing and sharing of experiences and so forth that do set you up, as you say, Rachel, that if something does happen, then you are probably better equipped to respond in, in a, a quicker, but also more um, suitable and sensitive way. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, so I'm going to switch now to um, asking Liz Gould's question. Um, so Liz is from Healthy and Underwater and she's asked, um, given the constraints imp imposed by our contemporary human endeavours um, from climate change to infrastructure and so on, do you think it's realistic to expect that ecosystems can recover from extremes by themselves in any situation? Or rather, is it that we do if we don't interfere or manage um, uh, we will see a recovery that may lead to a loss of species, ecosystems and other natural values, um, i.e. novel ecosystems. So I, I, I'm going to ask Dana to, to start us off on that one. Um, yes, yeah, so just I might just go back to your point before. I, I think there's a really good story from um, Fern Haynes um, from the Arthur Ryla Institute about the Black Saturday fires. Um, they were they were anticipating fires and they went in and extracted, I think they were Galax's little freshwater fishes um, and had a, a you know, sort of recovery population in, um, in tanks when the fires went through. Now those, those fish became a really significant cultural um, center for the recovery times. And so the idea of, of going, well, we, we can't think about the environment while we're thinking about you know, our livelihood um, can perhaps you know, be, be shorter in the time period of, and when you bring back the, the issue about the environment and see it as a positive because certainly in the Dandenongs and those areas now, looking after the fish, reintroduction of the fish was a really huge part of the community repairing after uh, those fires. And so see the recovery as a positive option for, for community repair is something to, to keep in the back of your minds. Yeah. Um, now back to the to Liz's really significant question. Um, it depends on on what the event was. So we have the you know, to look at the three you know the four options. Um, do you leave it leave something to recover? Um, quite often, as we say about cyclones, it might be best to leave recovery to to, to nature. But sometimes you do need to get in and, and repair. And so. Certainly mangrove forests, for example, you may, an example we use were the mangroves up in, um, uh, in the Gulf country where recovery wasn't happening because tides were coming in. There's so much debris from, from where these trees had just fallen over um, for a whole reason, a whole series of reasons. And that debris stood around and kept knocking out the, um, the ceilings recovering from the fires. And so there you needed to go in and help with to repair and remove some of the timber so that the seedlings could recover. So I think it's a case by case example, but one of the things we emphasize is that no action is no longer an option. You need to make a choice about what those actions are going to be. Now making a go, it, it will 
allow itself to recover is an active choice, but we can no longer sit back and have non-active choices. We, we need to make a choice because our ecosystems right across Australia are now in such a fragile state. It's a sad place to be, but we now need to be active. Um, and novel ecosystems and adaptation might actually be an option in some places when there's been so much, so much damage. Um, and we really are at that point. And it's, it's quite hard, certainly from, um, I'll go older ecologists, just like myself, um, because we grew up with a, oh, everything is, is natural, but it turned out not to be um, in terms of um, without humans, we, we were missing the element that we were living in an in, in indigenous ecosystem that had been modified by, by colonial activities. Um, so we, we're getting to a more mature understanding of the place that we live or the places that we live. Um, and so intervention isn't such a dirty word, but it is to a lot of old school ecologists. Um, so moving to novel ecosystems is something that's hard to some people, but it's somewhere we have to move to. And that involves moving species once you've understood what those impacts are, but we have enough tools to look at what those things, uh, what those impacts can be. Mm. Ewan. Uh, Dana touched on it right at the end, so I don't really need to add too much, but I think the the point she was making about indigenous people working on country and sarah's um video that she showed you know showed a really great example of that that you know in indigenous ranger programs as an example so humans are very much part of recovery and i think you know dana made that point really clearly that um this sort of idea that i think has been in sort of ecological circles if you like and environmental circles for quite a long time that if we sort of stay out of it and leave it alone that's actually the best option. But of course, that's just not even based on truth that humans have been shaping landscapes for millennia. Um, and so therefore they're actually part of um, both shaping them, but also helping them potentially to recover. So there's, there's, again, as devastating as some of these events have been, there's also opportunities um, available for people, you know, being on country, working on country, but again, you know, not, not for me to sort of speak about in detail, but I think that's a really important point to remember. And it goes back to the, the first day's awareness of the values. And in any environment, you, you know, as a, it's a cultural concept, what are the values that we, we think are important in this environment? So, you know, we, we value in, in, in Tasmania, um, the Gondwanan forest more than the, um, the other more flammable uh, vegetation. And so that, you know, we'll go in and protect the Gondwana and forests from fires because we know they won't recover from fire. So that's a it's a it's a choice. It's a, um, a human based values choice. And so just working out what what are your values? What are you wanting to to protect? Is that critical first question? And so even though we say your know, three A's sounds so simple, you know, or we you know um, awareness, anticipation, and action, it really has some really deep roots in there and it's that first thought that you'd have is what are we actually trying to protect here is it the you know is it property is it some element of the ecosystem um is it a cultural landscape asking that first question is fundamental to all the actions that we, we do in in our own yeah i think that's a really really important point um and it links a little bit to to alex knight's question in the chat which is um, this question of the social license to, in, um, you know, to take some of the actions. But um, I'm just going to kind of build that bridge, which is to say when you need a fast response, um, for example, into, into, you know, managing pigs and deer after a fire or, or similar, how does that interact with the social license? So I guess it's in two parts. First of all, how do we, um, how do we understand and know what the um, social um, values are in a landscape <laughs> you know what well, how do we build that that knowledge in the first place and then you know how do we manage the different views that you know around what what needs to be managed in a landscape uh, and and maybe conflicting views about what should be managed especially in an emergency Ewan do you want to yeah <laughs> I can touch briefly on that I mean it, it is definitely a fact that after the fires you know there was fairly extensive control of deer uh, in particular across quite large areas of Victoria, but horses weren't targeted. And 
as Alex's Alex's comment, comment you know, sort of um, draws attention to that. And I think, you know, I think we're all pretty aware that there is a lot more sensitivity, shall we say, towards horses than there is towards deer. Um, so, you know, I can't obviously speak for the Victorian government about why they decided to make the choice not to control horses, but yes to deer. I, I know, obviously, within Victoria, there has been a push towards controlling horses um, a bit more than some other parts of Australia. And so potentially they didn't want to jeopardise that sort of direction by going in there and doing things that may upset, you know, various sectors of the community. So that's something to be aware of. But I think it probably also highlights that, you know, you may not be able to do what you think necessarily is scientifically and evidence wise the best thing to do, but you can still do a lot of things that are tractable and will have impact. And so, yeah, with, with emerging the responses, you don't have time to sit down sometimes and, and sort of talk through with, you know, members of the community about, you know, we want to do this. Uh, how, how do you, how do you um, feel about that? How will that impact you? But so you have to make quick choices about things that you think will have less concern in the community and go about doing those. So um, again, I, I don't work for the Victorian government, so I can't speak too much about the decision-making that went behind that. Um, but I, th I think it's a very valid point. I mean, there's the question that horses will be impacting some of these environments just as much as deer are, but they absolutely are seen very differently in the community. That's just a fact. So it, it does provide challenges, but I think, again, you sort of have to often in emergencies go with the things that are tractable um, rapidly and then obviously think for the future, how might we also address this issue so that next time this happens, we can potentially do something differently. Who knows? So. So Sarah, I might just go to you on this question too uh, about building that social license in the, in the context um, of the emergency um, or, or you know, for the long term. Yeah, I guess, um, so I was just thinking about it in terms of the actual response at the time and the social license. I think in our region, you know, cyclones um, are very traumatic for a lot of people. And, um, you know, the, the last thing you want to do is do something that um, increases that trauma. And the, the really good point before about sort of um, people being involved in their recovery actions themselves as, as part of that healing process. Um, and so I think that that has to come because we're talking about people, as we know, you know, with people have created the problems that we're dealing with, um, that we have to take that into account in these emergency responses. Um, I'm not sure I quite understood your other question about how to prepare in advance. Is that what you meant? Yeah, how, how to sort of what, what that balance is between working in the post emergency around, you know, questions of social license, but also when, when is the right time to start um, shifting the conversation or, or uh, understanding what the community priorities are and, and what other, you know, ecological priorities might be and how to bring those together. Yeah, I think it depends who you're talking about involving at that point. As I said, I mean, I saw significant post traumatic stress in our region as a result of that, that those two cyclones close together. So the, the directly affected community, I'd say, you know, I, I saw that it was not it was not heavily involved in that discussion early on, um, but can, you know, now we're in a position to really be able to talk through those issues. And, and is why I was saying I really want to think about it again. And, and in terms of, we know that we haven't had one of those cyclones in 10 years, and that doesn't mean we won't get another one pretty soon. Mm, yeah. So now's the time, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's really telling that it can be you know a window of a decade before you're ready to actually go back to to some of the people who's who've lived through it, yeah. um, and something that's that's very acute for many of us um, in southeastern Australia certainly at the moment. Um, Simon, it's interesting, isn't it? When you go out in the field, you got to take your first aid kit, but it was only just last year, last year, out of my seventeen years that I actually did a mental health first aid course. And um, that, I found that really, really useful to try and understand what was going on because, yes, you're working on the environment, but it's the people within the environment to read that scenario. Um, I find it a bit frustrating over some of these uh, disasters that although, yes, within a rural fire service, it, it's, it's life, property and the environment, and that is the order in which generally people see things. But that's not to say you can't have access for teams looking after the environment you know, on par with some of the emergency responses at times. I think, I think that delayed response in knowing what's going on 
the environment is is quite detrimental at times, and that's one thing I'd like to see change. Yeah. Um, amongst a whole heap of other things, you know, within ministerial appointments, the the uh, agriculture space is seen as a junior position. Why is that? We all rely on the environment. Shouldn't that be elevated up to near treasury? This is in Simon's world anyway. <laughs> So I'm, I'm sure um, some of the people who, who work in door would be pleased to hear that those portfolios are, are elevated up um, in your world. Uh, look, we've got a little bit more time and, I, and I'm mindful that there's a really important question, but I am holding it back, um, the question of how we scale up. So, so we'll get to that in a moment. Just before we get to that, um, I want to um, uh, echo Sophie uh, and put back to you your question, uh, Simon, on whether testing an opinion is, is better than, you know, whether opinion is better than science. In other words, let's, let's have a, I'll, I'll try and sort of paraphrase what I think I heard from you when you asked that question. What do we do in an emergency and how do we make decisions and how do we make them as best as possible um, and, and link together what we know, but also not wait for research that may not be available to us at a given moment. How do we navigate that space? But there might be more to your question. So by, I'm just going to throw it back to you. Uh, you know, as Sophie puts it, isn't testing an opinion the starting point for research and science? So I'm going to go to you first, Simon, and then to our other panellists. Goodness, and how do you answer such a complex question that I asked? Um, yeah, I think, I think as others have said, doing nothing is not an option. Um, and what you do has to have legacy. So you've got to try and have others. If you haven't got the resources to monitor that beyond a year, beyond three years, whatever, you've got to try and integrate what you're doing into others that are specialists in that space. So they've got to be able to try and integrate in some ways. You've got to try and not walk over each other's goals. Um, but yeah, it, it, whatever you do, you've got to have some legacy. I know, I know this is probably a favourite topic of yours, um, Ewan, so I'm going to go to you now and see what you think about how to how to um, learn from um, experience and make calls on the fly, but also build in, um, you know, some of the research as well. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question and there's a huge opportunity uh, with this. So again, with all these horrible events, there is also this amazing opportunity to learn. Um, but that is partly contingent, of course, on resources and networks and partnerships. So, you know, in terms of testing opinions, if you like, if we could, um, in, some, in some cases, when we're doing these sort of interventions, do them in a more experimental manner. So apply treatments in some areas, don't do it elsewhere, if we, if we have that option. Uh, and it depends, of course, on the species and ecosystem you're talking about. There's huge opportunity to learn. And if you do that, that's essentially what we would call adaptive management, right? Adaptive management is about trying things, monitoring them, measuring them and saying, what happened? Did it work? If it worked, let's keep doing more of that. If it didn't, let's do something different and change our management regime. Mm -hmm. And so when we have these big events, you know, fires, floods and so forth, yeah, they're horrible, but it is essentially a big experiment also in an environmental sense. And so we could potentially do things and try different things, test opinions, if you like. And hopefully by doing that, you, you get some benefit inverted commas out of that um, because it means in the future, we'll be doing things in a more effective and efficient way that obviously is gonna be beneficial for the future. So I think, yeah, there's this really strong link there with what we call adaptive management, which we all sort of hold up as the gold standard and strive for, um, but for many reasons, it's quite difficult to do in reality. Talk about successes as well as failures too. Absolutely. Don't be, don't be I think afraid of a failure. That, that is such a crucial point. And I think, you know, I talk to colleagues about this all the time in government agencies is that in some cases, they don't want to do things because they're risky. And if they go wrong, then they get criticism, you know, either from within the organisation and also from the public. And I think that's really detrimental because it means we sometimes end up being risk averse and not doing things that might be quite different or even quite different, like really different, that could actually lead to breakthroughs. And so, you know, as scientists, I think, you know, I'm putting my academic hat on where we generally probably have more freedom to try really, really different things. But I think I sympathise with a lot of my friends and colleagues in some agencies who would love to be trying different things, but yet, like you said, Simon, they're, they're really worried about how the failures will be reported. And so I think as a community, 
we have a real importance there that to support our colleagues and say, well, this didn't work as well as we would have liked, but we learned this, this, and this. And so that's actually pushed us further along in terms of our thinking and understanding. And I think that should be, um, you know, sort of valued a lot more than it is. So Dana, yeah, I'm going to go to you now. Um, the place I'd go, and it also get to Ewan's question about um, scalability, is uh, a polycentric approach. Um, I'm, my name's got my name uh, at the moment, but there was a, a famous uh, economist who won a Nobel Prize on uh, looking at polycentric approaches to managing resources. Um, in that case, it was sort of urban areas. And her evidence was that instead of having one big agency being controlling everything, having multiple approaches often leads to a far better outcome. And so in terms of how do we scale up things like a bushfire, having multiple approaches and multiple organisations is something to, to, to have comfort with. Um, yes, we have a federal agency, which I've talked about, but we also have state agencies and we have um, NGOs and we have other small groups and land care and things like that and feel comfortable in having that polycentric approach because it will probably lead to a greater outcome than having just one approach to things. Um, so yes, you will find your errors, you will find your, your things that work and also narrative. Um, but one of the things I'm quite excited about is um, just looking at how communities have organised over the last election cycle. Um, a lot of people are involved in, in community groups now, I'm taking it out of the, the politics, but to look at community organisation and community conversations. I think more conversations have had in the last three or four months about climate change than in Australia for, for the last decade. Um, and I was interested in, in the Greens approach in Brisbane, where they were out sweeping mud off people's um, you know, porches and, and helping them clean up after a flood where they then got to talk about what their approach to climate change was. So it's not a political statement, it's an organisational observation. Um, and Sarah's talking about getting ready for the next cyclone. So that being out there, having those conversations, anticipating what's going to happen, and then talking about approaches um, is, I think, a way in which the polycentric approach to managing and scaling up. We will have more extreme events. Um, you and I are part of a group at the moment looking at this recent um, you know, extreme event. How did, it, how did we have heat waves in Antarctica um, and massive rainfalls on the East Coast? And, and what were those slow on effects? So that's what we're focused on at the moment. There's such a short period of time since the last ones. Um, yes. So it will continue and we need more yes. preparation. Yeah. So I'm going to, I think this, this is the time to switch to Ewan's question and talk about scaling up and, and how quickly we need to do it and whether we're going to, whether we're doing it already or whether we need a lot more to get there. And I'm going to go to Ewan, who I'm mindful has to duck out just a couple of minutes early. We'll probably go just a little past the 12.30 mark uh, for those who can stay. But Ewan. Um, no worries. I think it's rare for a Ewan to respond to another Ewan. So that's a nice change for me. <laughs> um yeah, look, it's it's such a great question. And I think, you know, it is happening already. So in terms of, you know, how we deal with these issues, we definitely need to be thinking at a landscape scale and that, you know, things like the herbivore management and fire management are pretty clear examples of that. But really fine scale interventions as well can make a big difference. So an example of that is, you know, across the um, fire affected areas of Gippsland, um, you know, uh, consultants have put in chainsaw hollows for some of the arboreal mammals um, because they may have lost hollow bearing trees. And so they take 100, 150 years, 200 years to come back some of those trees in terms of forming hollows that are appropriate for wildlife. So, you know, I don't, I don't again, see it as a single scale <laughs> that we need to be operating at, but we're going to have to operate at a whole range of scales to achieve different outcomes. And I know that sounds really, really obvious, but that's just, that's just the reality of, of what we have to do for ecosystems. And again, that's just a, a matter of relationships and investment and resourcing. So to, to be effective across that different scale and for different things, we're gonna to need to have those, those networks and relationships in place that Sarah spoke about so you know, wonderfully and, and, and have resourcing as well to do that you know, at that scale. Because you know, in case of 
you know, things like um, feral herbivore management, you know, that's going to have to happen for years because these, these, these habitats um, that have been burnt so extensively as such large areas are going to recover over years. But the deer population, unless it's kept down low where it was controlled, is going to come straight back up again. So there's going to need to be long-term commitments to actions. And I think that's another really important thing, again, which links back to relationships across agencies, you know, across communities is saying, this is our vision for this environment, for this landscape, you know, for this area, and we're going to commit to these actions. Because unless you commit to them long-term, um, then some of the work, the great work you might do may be undermined, you know, down the track. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot in that question. We could literally talk about the answer to this question for hours. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I might go to Sarah next on this question, scaling up. Yeah, sure. And um, I guess I'll, I could just give the experience that we're having in the wet tropics right now, um, where you know we as a as a community of, of community groups and and scientists and researchers and um, and agencies know that to make our region resilient to climate change, particularly at those world heritage areas that we have, the wet tropics world heritage area, that we really need to scale up our restoration efforts. And we know. Um, They've been sort of in the hundreds of hectares of restoration over the last 20 or 30 years. And we know we need tens of thousands of hectares of rainforest restoration and woodlands restoration to, to make our region resilient. So we're doing a whole range of things up here at the moment and, and it's quite exciting. It's also, there's a lot of balls in the air, but you know we're, we're investigating a range of market mechanisms and looking for direct investment into the region, knowing that government hasn't got the answers to all, but the support we get from government is extremely important. Um, we're looking at how we um, prioritise the most important parts of the landscape to work in first and direct that investment and and, and um, work strategically at, at a range of levels. So from the community groups who are voluntarily planting trees, you know, to, to state and federal agencies and, um, and thinking about that sort of regional recovery and resilience planning and prioritisation to help with that. But also the one other thing is... Um, we're sort of putting together a restoration alliance for the region of that range of different groups. And um, the other thing to think about is as you scale up, you also need to scale up your nursery, in the case of restoration, your nurseries, your, um, your um, plant, your people who can do the planting and maintenance. And so that requires actually some real strategic thinking around building capacity in the region and doing it in a way uh, that, you know, that's actually going to be able to we, you, could, you could for one get the investment but not be able to deliver the outcome for example so trying to get the trying to get to where you need to get to yeah absolutely. probably <laughs> the end of a long no. session yeah thank you sarah so simon um any last thoughts on on scaling up from you um just the scaling up as, as this is pointed out there requires a commitment but also an understanding that um, you know, the amounts that are available at the moment are, are pretty minuscule. And I guess it's a confidence, it's reflective of the confidence that as a sector, we know what we're doing. Um, we may talk about failures and that sort of thing, but it's not a failure overall. It's, it's a learning process. And yeah, that's what I'd say about that. Yeah, great. And I might uh, give the last word to you, Dana. Um, were there any final thoughts you wanted to share with our room before we finish? Ah, oh, okay. And there um the, the big thought is one of um, economics, um, being able to identify ecosystem services um, in order to make the argument for greater resources is probably a critical argument to, to make to allow those funds to, to scale up. Um, so we understand the, you know, the links between ecosystems and our value, our quality of life, but trying to make that into a, a funding area is pretty important. Um, so I think that's, a, unfortunately, the point is to end on for me. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's really important. And I will note that, and I popped the um, the link to the paper in the Q&A, but I might um, also pop it just in the chat for those who are still with us, um, because um, I think uh, one of the things that you'll find in the very detailed appendix material is comments on those ecosystem services that are that are being lost or threatened by um, by ecosystem collapse in in the original paper as well. 
But um, I might just finish up there and, and give some thoughts of my own on this, um, which is that learning from each other and working together is going to be even more critical as we go forward. And I think that's something that's really hit home for me listening to this whole discussion is how we work together um, uh, from, you know, research and government, uh, NRM uh, and, uh, you know, land care and community groups, First Nations groups is um, is going to make the difference, I think, on whether we actually do effectively scale up and whether we learn from these experiences to embed them into future practice. Um, I think we've already started some really important conversations um, uh, today, and I hope that we will find uh, other ways to continue to explore this conversation on, on how we can um, uh, bring all our um, perspectives together and all our activities together to really understand and embed resilience into the future. Thank you, everyone. You can um, provide any final thoughts and comments on the chat. Thanks for those who stuck with us to the end. And thank you very much to all our speakers, um, Dana, Sarah, Simon, and of course, Ewan, um, and also um, to my colleague, Rachel, who's been helping out behind the scenes. There are some links in the chat to our website, um, to the video that Terrain produced, uh, and also my email address. So please get in touch if you have any final thoughts. And, um, and thank you all. We'll see you again soon.